Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. Our passage today is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 4. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort in all our affliction. I am overflowing with joy. May God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Thank you, Brian. That was a great last song, music team. Very nice. Christ is our living hope. Um, the, the passage today, uh, I think the, one of the real feelings behind it or sort of themes is just a, is a, a positive, uplifting attitude. Um, attitude is something that's talked about a lot in society today. I mean, I learned a lot about it as a businessman, as a manager, but it's something that's talked about a lot. It, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, there's a po- sort of a positivity movement out there, and of course you want, you want people at work to be happy, you want people to be happy in their, their, their lives, and, beca- and because, because it's thought of this way in society so much, sometimes we disconnect from it, a little bit in the church, and we don't kind of see the relevance. But it's like other things in the church, that in Christ, and by the Spirit of Christ, we have a positive outlook about all things, about everything, right? I mean, Scripture teaches us have joy in all things, even. I mean, that's a high bar. I mean, that's even a much higher bar than even the motivational speakers sort of try to go for. So I think this passage really, the theme of it kind of goes along that track, the overall theme. Um, as we get going here, if you looked at the verse while Brian was, was, uh, was leading us through the verse at the beginning, we see that love never quits. He says, make room in your hearts for us, right? Right? Paul says, love never quits. In 1 Corinthians 13, 8, Paul says, love never fails. He says there, love never ek pepe. And you can tra- translate this love never fails, like you all know who've studied this in 1 Corinthians 13, a famous passage. You can translate it, love never fails. But you could also translate it, love never drops away. Or love never falls away. You could translate it that way. I dare say that today you can translate it, love never quits. Love never quits. That's what Paul is saying in our verse also. Love never quits. He says to the Corinthian church, make room in your hearts for us. In other words, don't quit loving us. Don't stop. You have no reason to do so. This is a good word for me, and it's a good word for you. Never stop loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Never stop trying to reconcile with them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet. Um, We all must learn that our own wisdom will fail. We all must learn that human wisdom as a whole will fail, but that your wisdom never does. As your word teaches us, lean not on your own understanding, but follow the Lord in all your ways. And so, Lord, your wisdom is is what we need. Your wisdom, along with your Holy Spirit in us, in confluence with the Word of God is what sustains us in our day-to-day life. We make many mistakes. All of us do. Uh, Every person here will make a mistake today. Every person here will make a mistake today. But Lord, you never make mistakes. And it's okay that we do. By grace, by your grace, it's okay. But 
Lord, you never make mistakes, and, and you teach us the endurance of love and the depth of Christian bond in Christ. And Paul brings a lot of that out today. So we thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our title today is Love and Reconciliation Always and Again. Love and Reconciliation Always and Again. It's 2 Corinthians 7, 2 through 4. Point one is asking for reconciliation again. That's verse 2a. Paul has asked the Corinthian church for reconciliation already. We saw that not that long ago. He's asking again. He's asking again. Make room in your hearts for us. Asking for reconciliation again. Point two, taking away the excuses not to reconcile. Every person makes excuses not to love another person, not to reconcile with another person, even not to like another person. Here we see Paul taking away the excuses from those in the Corinthian church who would not reconcile with him. That's verse 2b. Point three, we're together in this. Verse three, we're together in this. Point three and verse three. And point four, encouraging others. That's verse four. I find that people make excuses for not doing things in general. I mean, you can go right down the line. I mean, this is sort of what it means to kids learn this in school when they're little, right? They don't study throughout the semester. They've always got a reason not to study. And then before the test, you know, that day before the test, it's, oh boy, now I've got to study for 12 hours or 20 hours in a row. You know, I've got to cram, right? And there was always some reason that they couldn't study before, whether it was friends or movies or screen time or whatever it was. But the truth is that, that, that those were excuses and that they then put themselves in a bad situation. Most of the people, not all, not all, but most of the people I, I knew who did well academically over the years, most of them studied steadily throughout the semester. Once in a while, there was somebody who could jam it all down at the end, but that's just a word since it's graduation Sunday. But I do find that people make excuses for not doing things in general, and often they rationalize. They rationalize why. And Paul does not do this, and neither should we. He always makes the extra effort to love and reconcile with others. Keep that in mind. If you're at odds with somebody, anybody, a family member, a friend, a coworker, it's not up to them to come and try to make up with you. It'd be great if they did. But it's up to you as a Christian, especially with your brothers and sisters, to take the initiative to take that step forward, to make that phone call, to make five phone calls, to make 30 phone calls. I only remember this now. There was a lady at the, my last church who was mad at me. I called her every week for 30 weeks in a row, trying to talk to her. Finally, we did reconcile, not then, five years later, by continued effort. You never stop trying to reconcile with your brother's and sisters in Christ. You never stop. You never stop. For many reasons, including that it hinders your relationship with God when you're not in right relationship with them. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love others as yourself, right? Does it make sense? So Paul doesn't rationalize why he does not love and reconcile. He always makes the effort and he keeps making it. So point one now, asking for reconciliation again. This is just 2A. Just read 2A with me. Just the first half. A is my nomenclature since the verse is 2. It's the first half of 2. But it's a common thing that pastors and theologians do to add A and B and C if necessary. Make room in your hearts for us. Make room in your hearts for us. This is a very uh, direct statement. Grammatically, it's actually almost a command. 
For it reminds me of Christ saying, give us this day our daily bread. It has the same tense, it has the same force as that statement, grammatically. Love is food indeed. Grace is food indeed. Remember I just said it reminds me, give us this day our daily bread. Love is food indeed. Grace is food indeed. Reconciliation is food indeed. Spiritual food. What this means is a change in attitude. This means a change in your attitude towards another person. Like we talked about uh, during the last few weeks, stop rejecting others, stop blaming others, stop rationalizing, and, and love. I don't like to th- say things like stop, and I don't like to get you know, legalistic or moralistic, But the fact is, there are certain things we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't shouldn't be blaming others for things in general, right? So don't do that, but rather love. We should be loving. Jesus teaches us to love. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Seek ways to make peace with others and reconcile. Don't give in to the sin of blame, right? I didn't say it that clearly the other week when I talked about Adam blaming in the garden. Don't give in to the sin of blame, which has affected men and women since the garden. It indeed affects the evangelical church today. The evangelical church in America is in danger of becoming known to outsiders as blamers and complainers. Do you make room in your hearts for other people, especially other Christians? Can you make room in your hearts for other presbyteros like Paul? It's not always easy because many, many people can be a pain, right? Many people can be a pain, including myself. I can be a pain, right? We all can be a pain under certain circumstances, under certain conditions. But Paul says, nonetheless, he urges Make room in your hearts for us. Uh, there was this guy um, I knew um, many years ago. This is before I was a pastor. I think it was when I was a deacon. And he was a, he was a super, super nice guy. I mean, he was a really just, just a nice guy. He'd, he'd, uh, he'd, I think he'd gone to Liberty, and he was... Um, he, he 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 he'd had a good job uh, when he was younger, but then some things went wrong for him. He lost his good job. He ended up working at Chick Fil A, and he was in his thirties. And it's great working at Chick Fil A. My daughter works at Chick Fil A, but he ended up he ended up in a very different position. He went ended up have, go, having to go from like an engineering type level job to working at Chick Fil A because some things went wrong in his life. He made some he made some mistakes. And um, he wanted to hang out with me, right? I don't really know why. I mean, he played basketball, I think, at Liberty maybe even. He wanted to hang out with me. He wanted to talk and just spend time together. And I, I, I really didn't want to. I didn't want to because he kind of annoyed me in some ways. Um, he wasn't quite my personality type. He was from a different part of the country. He, he'd gone through all this stuff, and I knew that if I spent time with him, I was going to end up talking to him about all the stuff that he'd gone through. And I, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to make that kind of investment of, of time then. I mean, I wasn't full-time in ministry, of course. I was, had a full-time job, and I, I could tell he was going to be a big drain on time. But he called me week after week after week, and he wanted to just hang out. I mean, I'd never done anything wrong to him. He just wanted to hang out. Finally, I said to myself, you know what? I'm the problem. He's not the problem. I'm the problem. And I need to start visiting with him. And I started accepting his invitations. As a brother in Christ, he was asking me, and this isn't exactly, I mean, there's there's an eldership presbyteros relationship here that Paul's talking about, but I'm also talking to you as congregants. As a brother in Christ, he was asking me to make room for him in my heart and life. I was rejecting him for personal reasons, not for anything he had done. 
not to me. Point two now, taking away the excuses not to reconcile. Taking away the excuses not to reconcile. If you look with me at 2b, this is what Paul says. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. Paul's saying that to the Corinthian church, some of the Christians there. The implication there is that some of them are saying he has done these things. There's that type of either an implication or even possibly accusation. To me, these are the excuses that some in the Corinthian church are making not to reconcile with Paul. They have charged Paul with either wronging them or corrupting them, or taking advantage of them. Um, some, some scholars think that the idea here was that they thought that Paul took the collection money for those in Jerusalem for himself. That's what some scholars speculate, but nobody knows. Nobody knows why uh, these, these Corinthians, Corinthians Christians in the church, why they were alleging these things against Paul. I don't think you really have to, I mean, as a minister, as a pastor or presbyteros, you don't really, I mean, I'm telling you this, I mean, you can believe it or not believe it. I've been a senior pastor 14 years. Uh, you don't have to do anything for somebody to allege something against you. You don't have to do anything. I mean, two people can be talking both of them don't like you, and one of them says something just a little bit off of straight on the railroad tracks, and then it can go around as a rumor. That's true. That's true. I don't know if you guys ever noticed this, but, but when people gossip, things morph. They don't stay the same. I remember even when I was 14 in psychology class in high school, the psychology teacher had us do this little experiment, and, and he told the first person on the right-hand side, a little secret, and then each one passed it back through the class. And, and it started out being something like, you're caring for a dog. And by the time it hit the person in the back of the class, it was, you killed a cat. <laughs> I mean, it was two completely different things. And it, it, that's what happens. So, so did the Apostle Paul do anything wrong? Well, the scriptural witness is that he did not. But the scriptural witness also here is that these Corinthian Christians are stating or believing or acting as if he did, and they're using these, these things as an excuse not to reconcile with him, not to love him, not to be in relationship with him. And so therefore, Paul just comes right out and says it, and this is what a good minister always does. A good minister just comes at things head on, not, not, not little games on the side. And he says, we have wronged no one. Paul says to them, I have not wronged you. I have not corrupted you. I have not taken advantage of you. My teaching for you has been true and real. And you know what? People don't really realize this either, but one of the clearest signs that somebody in ministry is behaving the right way to you is that they're actually preaching the word to you, not something else. And the reason that's such a clear sign is because as somebody prepares and learns to preach or to teach the word, God works on them through that word. And the things that are wrong with them over time, God fixes them through the word. Just like God fixes us, all of us in the congregation through the word, right? And so that's why, that's why you can tell it's so easy. You know, you know when somebody, so Paul never did that. His teaching to them was always correct. I never really understood this before I was a pastor. Uh, uh, I read a book, somebody gave me a book to read on um, Billy Graham, and Billy Graham was ordained at a very young age. To me, probably too young. I don't really think somebody should be ordained in their early 20s. But of course, 
this was Billy Graham. Who am I to question it? So, so, but Billy Graham was ordained really young, and he came before his ordination council, and they started asking him questions. And he gave what I thought was a very funny, almost arrogant response. He said, come on, guys, you've heard me preach. That's the answer to your ordination exam? Come on, guys, you've heard me preach? I thought that was crazy when I read it in the book. But then, after I'd been a pastor for a number of years, the answer made sense to me. Because nobody could preach like Billy Graham. Nobody could teach as accurately as he taught without being on the right track. Sure, he made some mistakes. He made a lot of mistakes. Even Billy Graham made a lot of mistakes. I'm not going to say what they were. He made a lot of mistakes, but he was still a great preacher and teacher, and he was faithful. He didn't wrong people. Paul did not wrong anyone. He didn't corrupt people through his teaching. So whatever some in the Corinthian church may feel towards Paul, they are rationalizing why they shouldn't love and reconcile and listen to him. So in general, you and I, all of us, we have this kind of a tendency. It's also, it's, it's also an, a tendency of an attitude that's not quite right. We, we don't like someone for some reason, anybody. Could be somebody at work, could be somebody at school, could be somebody in any place. We don't like somebody for some reason, and then we look for reasons to disregard them. Right? It's not really the other way around usually. Usually we don't like somebody first, and then we look for the problems with them. If we like them, then we don't look for the problems. We look for something else, right? That's a general human tendency. I don't know if you agree with me, but that's what I've observed over the years. Unfortunately for us, when we have this type of outlook, this type of attitude, God does not accept this attitude in the church. And he especially does not accept it when church members are doing this towards each other or to to their minister who set forth to watch over them. God appointed Paul to watch over the Christians in the Corinthian church. But this is what Paul's getting on the back end. Paul's not going to have it. He says, that was never done to you. Those things that are being said were never done. Um. Some years ago, uh, again, before I was a pastor, I knew a pastor who, who pastored at a congregation, and, and people like Paul is going through here, people in the congregation would question everything that he did. Whatever he did, there are 50 or 100 voices that came up out of the ether and said, why are you doing this? 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 Unfortunately, this pastor was not as wise as Paul or as loving. You've noticed through 2 Corinthians that Paul has been loving the Corinthian church. He's been wooing them back. This this person was not, not of that type of character. Instead of answering their questions and charges and trying to reconcile with them, this pastor would set up teams of people that would fight for him against those who didn't like him. He made it political, which we should never do. Love and grace demand that we open our hearts to our brothers and sisters and reconcile with them. If there's a Christian in your life who you are unreconciled with or closed off to, think about making up with them today. Um, when When I say these things, I'm talking about it from a pretty high bar. That's, that's the Lord's bar for us with this. If, if, if um, it, can I use you, Miles? Okay. We haven't seen Miles for a while. You know, Miles moved like 55 miles. How far is it? 45 miles. Four, miles. Miles moved 45 miles from the church, and he was here for a long time. It was a total surprise when he came today. I was so happy to see him. As soon as I saw him, I said, what I say to you? I'm happy to see you. I'm very happy to see you. When are you coming back? You know, I'm, you know I, I love seeing you, right? And, and so, 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 but I understood he moved away, and I understood, and we talked about that at the time. You know, well, 
well, my, you know, Miles, Miles came up to me, you know, before service, and that's why I asked if I could. And he, so this is all spontaneous, right? This was not planned. So Miles came up to me uh, before service, and he asked if he could take me to lunch today, right? And I, and I, and I declined because I'd already planned, my daughter and I had already set, set aside a special time to have lunch today. So I, I told Miles that. And he said, well, I could take you, take you both. Well, I'd love that. I'd love that, but I, you know, but I cherish my time with my daughter, and I've been out of town for 11 days. So I want to take my daughter today. I didn't tell Miles that, but maybe I should have, that I, I'd been out of town in Chicago for 11 days. So, so I need to take my daughter and have some, some personal time with her, Right? Now, I'm going to tell you, when I did that, at the moment that I declined Miles, I examined my own heart at that moment, my conscience, and I asked myself, are you saying no because you don't want to go out to eat with Miles, or are you saying no because you want to go out to eat with your daughter? I asked, I asked myself that question as a secondary conscience matter. And I, and I found that I did want to go out to eat with my daughter, that I didn't have anything in my heart that was reluctant to go out to eat with Miles. I was not closed off to Miles. I had an open heart towards Miles. This is the kind of way that you know. You know by very practical examples. If somebody comes and walks up to you to greet you, are you happy to see them? Do you want to talk to them? Or are you talking to them only because you have to, only because it's the polite thing to do? If you're doing it because you're happy to and want to, your heart is open to them. If you're doing it because you have to and it's the polite thing to do, then your heart is closed off to them. Paul is saying, open your heart to us. Open your heart to me. Get rid of these things that are getting in the way of our relationship. I didn't do anything to you, Paul is saying. Right? We make up things, honestly. We make up things that people do to us. We imagine them. They don't mean to. Somebody gives us a look, right? You, 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 you come out of the washroom and somebody gives you a, a look and that look is a little bit funny and you interpret something from that look. That might be right, it might be wrong. Who knows? Right? You may never know, right? But, but if those kind of things build up, then it becomes incumbent upon you as a Christian, as a brother and sister in Christ, to take those things away. And this is why I love Matthew 18. I wasn't going to talk about this. But this is why I love Matthew 18. And also that I love the scripture that says, if anyone has anything against you, go talk to them today. Leave your gift at the altar. There's no time to waste. If you're not comfortable with somebody, it's your obligation to go talk to them. It's not their obligation to chase you around. If they do, that's great. That might happen, it might not. But it's your obligation to go see them and to be as clear in your thoughts and feelings as possible and to explain to them exactly what you don't like, what you're upset about, blah, blah. And you know what? Five, six, seven, eight, nine times out of ten, you're going to find out that that whole thing was a big misunderstanding. And you're holding on to this stuff that separates you and closes you off from a brother or sister in Christ. You're holding on to that because you misinterpreted and you never tried to reconcile. Love and grace demand that we open our hearts to our brothers and sisters and reconcile with them. If there's a Christian in your life who you are unreconciled with or closed off to, think about making up with them. Think about it. Just think about it. Based on, on my appeal, the scriptures appeal to you today. Think about making up with them today. And please, whatever you do, stop looking for reasons or excuses not to like them. And start looking for reasons to like them. You see the difference in attitude? It's like going to your job and being positive versus negative about it. If I, 
you could have the best job in the world. You could be making half a million dollars, have a secretary, uh, have somebody bringing you your coffee in the morning, get to be, set your own schedule. You could have the best job in the world and, and you could wake up every morning and think to yourself, you know what? I don't want to go into work today and look for reasons not to. Or you could have a job that's not so good and you could look for reasons to go to work each day and have a positive. This is the same. Don't look for reasons or excuses not to connect for people. Look for reasons to connect with them, to like them. Now we're in point three. We're together in this. Please read verses, uh, verse three of 2 Corinthians 7 for me. We're together in this. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts. Hmm, in our hearts. To die together and to live together. When you want to avoid someone, another Christian, when you want to avoid another Christian, you should ask yourself one simple question. Will I be able to avoid them in heaven? Will I be able to avoid them in heaven? All true believers live together in Christ. Verse 3 is a statement of sacrificial love. The second part. I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. This is a statement of sacrificial love. Paul would even die with the Corinthians, Corinthian Christians and he will live with them. Indeed, they die to themselves together in Christ and live together in Christ. We always need to keep our eyes focused on Christ, not just in the here and now, but also in the eternal. Additionally, verse 3 communicates... Friendship. Friends live out their lives together and sometimes even face death together. Um, one thing that's always amazed me over the years, and um, I want to be careful how I say this, I mean, because, it, because um, a Christian funeral is both a setting of um, grief and sadness and sorrow and comfort. It's both that, and it's also a celebration of the person's homecoming. So it's a lot different than the funeral for somebody who's not, who's not a Christian or for a group of people who are not Christians, because for them, it's just the grief piece but, but there's rarely any celebration piece, right? Do you follow me? So I want to be careful what I'm talking about. Set that out first. But I've always been amazed over the years going to Christian funerals, seeing groups of people who maybe have not seen each other for 20, 30, 40 years, but at some point, they were in the church together for, for a long time. Maybe they were members together of a church for five years or 10 years or 20 years. And now they haven't seen each other for 10 years or 15 years or, or maybe even longer, but now they're coming together. They're seeing each other again for the first time in that kind of a setting at a Christian funeral. Does, does this make sense to those who are older? Does this make sense? Right? You know what that shows me when I see that? It shows me what the end of this verse says. It shows me that we are going to die together and we are going to live together. We live together here in community now. And we die to ourselves here in community now. But eventually, on this earth, we're all also as Christians, we're going to die together. You know? I mean, one day, some of you who, are, well, certainly Lydia, but one day, some of you who are younger, you know, you, you know, you'll go to my funeral. 
Maybe. Maybe, unless you don't like me. <laughs> right? Right? That's coming. We die together, and we live together in Christ. Right? And so to be somber about this and put into perspective, look at what Paul's context is. It's to reconcile. It's to make peace. It's to be together, living together, getting along together, having a good attitude towards each other. He's bringing up a really big point together t- today right here. You, you can think about somebody however you want, but at the end of the day, the other Christians that you're in Christian communities together, you all are living together, or we all are living together, and we're dying together. We're dying together and living together. And there's no way around it. There's no way around it. Right? As I said, even if you, even if you don't see somebody again from this day forward, you'll see them in heaven. The Corinthians spent their time together, together here, then they will live out their lives together eternally. You can move as Miles moved, or you can change churches, or you can even change denominations, but you're stuck with your sisters and brothers in Christ forever. That's an additional reason to always open your hearts to them and to reconcile with them if you have not done so already. Point four now, encouraging others. Please read verse four with me. I am acting with great boldness towards you. That should not be a surprising statement based on Paul's just finished saying that we die together and live together. I'm acting with great boldness towards you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort in all our affliction. I am overflowing with joy. Paul has a big heart. In addition to asking the the Corinthian Christians to make room for him in their hearts, Paul then encourages them. He takes away their excuses not to reconcile, which is a good thing. He's careful to tell them he's not condemning them, which is a good thing. Now he brags on them a little bit. Now he encourages them. Now he unites them. This is certainly done by God's grace. It's not normal when people are mad at you and making accusations against you. It's not human to encourage them in this way. I have great pride in you. I'm filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I'm overflowing with joy. That's not a normal human response. That's a a response imbued with the divine. This is certainly done by God's grace. The Corinthians have wounded Paul, yet he builds them up. Uh, Again, I'm sorry I'm... um, using so many pastoral examples and examples of pastors today, but that's really what this is. Paul is the over-pastor to the Corinthian church, and that's the context of this. And when he says towards us, he's talking about presbyteros. This this is a, a pastoral passage. That's why you're getting pastoral illustrations. Once upon a time, there was a pastor. Uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Once upon a time, there was a pastor who walked into a committee meeting, and the had the kitchen sink thrown at him as soon as he walked through the meeting. I mean, everybody just unloaded. I mean, they must have they planned it together. But one of the committee members who was there, even though I wasn't there, one of the committee members who was there told me about it firsthand. And he explained to me what happened. He said that the pastor said nothing, not one word as he was getting unloaded on. But after they finished unloading on him, he patiently told all the committee members that he would pray for them. That's all he said. That's all he said, and then he left. Went went outside the meeting, went outside the church, stood outside the church. After the meeting, when the the committee came out, my friend, the, the one on the committee who told me about this, he went up to the pastor and he said, That must have felt terrible going through that. And this is what I learned, and this is why I'm telling you the story. This is what I learned then. The pastor said to this committee member, not at all. I felt bad for the people that were upset in the room, that they were upset instead of being at peace. Brothers and sisters, Paul is bringing the Corinthian church to love, 
reconciliation and peace in Christ. That's what this is about. Christ does this for us with God the Father through his cross and resurrection. Brings us to reconciliation and to right relationship with God, to peace with God. Christ does this for us with God through his cross and resurrection. But listen carefully. We do this with each other through grace and the word. We come to reconciliation and love with, and peace with others through grace and the word. Paul shares this grace through the word. Love and reconciliation always and again. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that, Paul, that Paul's love never quit, that Paul's love never failed, and that because of it, in part, through your grace, by your Holy Spirit, the Corinthian church continued to be built up even when there was such um, angst there, even when there was such um, wrongful attitudes and thoughts. Lord, please help us to take the lesson that your word has us for our daily lives with all other Christians, that we seek to reconcile, not to put up barriers, but we seek to reconcile and to make peace with all other Christians. Sometimes people will see things a different way than we see them, and there's nothing wrong with that. We've, we're all different. We've had different experiences. We have, have had different thoughts different exposures, Lord. So, so we will not see eye to eye on every subject with everyone all the time. That's impossible. But you call us always to love other Christians and you call us always to have an open heart and an open attitude towards them and to be at reconciled and at peace with them. Help us, Lord. Help us together. Help us to do this. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.